Hey everyone, this is Kim Singh here. Really excited to be here at Perisher Valley, but I'm really more excited to talk to you about how two things that I love, mathematics and the snow, uh, actually go hand in hand together. Uh, whether it's why you should buy a season pass, uh, how much air time can I get, or how do they determine the difficulty of the different runs in the mountain, or even whether the snow that you see today will be to tomorrow, uh, it's all hidden there in plain sight. So, without further ado, let's jump into it. And the first bit of maths that you'll need at the snow is related to financial maths. And basically, well, I kept seeing these signs around Perisher, and they said that all you need to do to make up your money for the season pass is ski five days. And I was thinking to myself, okay, how true is this? And also, how much money am I actually gonna save? The answer, well, it depends. So what does it depend on? Well, the first thing it depends on is when you go. For example, if we go in the peak season, and that's usually around August, you can see here that the price of a single ticket is $175. And so the math speaks for itself that if you go for five days, then naturally it should be $875. So you have made up your money in five days. But if we compare this to another date, like October 1st, you can see that actually, well, it's only gonna cost $152. And in total, that's only gonna cost us $760 for five days. So in that case, it doesn't seem quite worth it then. There's another thing to consider is that actually you can buy these multi-day tickets and usually multi-day tickets are a little bit cheaper. Have a look. So even in the peak season there, that's only going to cost us $705 for five days. So what's the benefit of the season pass then? Well, firstly, you get a lot more than five days. And so that already is an advantage over just buying a lift ticket. But also it's the flexibility. Because when you buy a lift ticket, you have to use those five days consecutively in a row. But when you buy a season pass, you can split those up however much you'd like. For example, you go do a trip in the weekend, you can do a trip in school holidays, or even during the week. So there's always benefits in purchasing a season pass if it suits you. So how much airtime can I get exactly? Well, it's pretty hard to measure how high you can jump while you're in the air. You can't exactly get a measuring tape out um, in the middle of a jump. But what I can do with a little bit of mathematics is I can look at the height of myself in that particular position. Now to measure myself out in that position, I am gonna need a little bit of help. But once I can do that, I can take this height and use it to compare it to an image of myself here and look at that height of the position compared to the distance off the ground. So now that I've worked out exactly how tall I am in that position, I can get my trusty ruler out here and I can look at how many notches I cover uh, on this scale over here. So it looks like I cover about one, two, three, four notches using this ruler here. And we know that those four notches are the same as 105 centimeters in real life. So to work out the height of one of those notches, I can just do 105 divided by four. That's gonna give me 26.25 centimeters. And so now I can work out exactly how much airtime I got by counting the notches above the ground. It looks like I've got one, two, three, four. We'll go four and a half there just to be nice. And so to work out exactly how much airtime I got, I can just do 4.5, that's how many notches I covered multiplied by 26.25 centimeters. That's how much the notches are in real life. And so that gives me a total of 118.125 centimeters off the ground. Now ski runs are full of all sorts of different trails to accommodate all different types of riders. From the easiest, the green runs, to the experts, the double black runs. To celebrate the first run I ever did, I took a picture to commemorate this. It was a bit of a struggle, but I got there at the end. I later found out, funnily enough, that this run is called the Easy Rider. Now, I took a picture to try and show how steep it actually was. Now, if you want to show how steep a run is, this is probably not the angle that you want. This is a side-on view of a blue run on Mount Perisher called Towers. Now, to work out just how to categorize these different runs, we can look at the steepness. And how do you measure the steepness exactly? Well, a mathematical way of doing this would be looking at its gradient. The gradient we define as the rise over run. What do I mean by that exactly? Well, the rise is literally how far up something goes, and the run is literally how far across something goes. So if we wanted to work out the gradient of this run, keeping in mind that we're working with this perspective that we've got, we could look at the boxes on the side. We can see that the run starts roughly around here, and it ends roughly around here. So let's have a look at how far up it is, or the rise. One, two, three, four, five. 
Now, we're not actually interested in how much distance this covers. We're only looking at this in terms of a ratio. We're comparing two things together. So it's okay that we don't have any units. Let's look at what the run will be. And so the run is roughly about 15 with a bit of rounding going on there. And so we can say that the gradient, the rise over the run, is 5 over 15, or we can simplify that as 1 over 3. Now initially, this number, 1 over 3, might not seem all that significant. Another way you might want to think about it is you can think about the triangle that you've just created here, and you could look at the angle which is created here. We usually refer to this as the Greek letter theta. To work out theta, we have to use a trigonometric ratio called tan, and we will say that tan theta is equal to the opposite over adjacent, or the numbers that we just found, 5 over 15. So that's equal to 5 over 15. And using what we call the inverse trig ratio, we can actually work out what this angle is. And when you calculate that out, you're going to get roughly 18.43 degrees. We'll just round it off to the nearest whole number. So we'll say that's 18 degrees. So these numbers might not seem that significant, but it's because we don't have anything to compare it to. Let's compare it to a black run. Now this is a side on view of a black run. And it's a bit of a step up from Easy Rider and Towers. In fact, it's actually called Kamikaze, appropriately. And so again, we can use the same idea of finding the gradient of this run. Again, just picking the two points it looks like it's roughly starting from and ending at. And we're going to count the grid um, for seeing the gradient, the rise of a run of this particular run. So let's count it out. So again, we can calculate the gradient, the rise over the run, and that's going to give me roughly 9 over 14. But again, what does this number mean? Well, let's construct our triangle here and find out what the angle is because that's going to be an easier number to compare than that fraction there. Again, using the same trick with our trigonometric ratio of tan, we can construct this equation. And checking the answer, that's going to give us an angle of about 28.07 degrees. Or again, let's just round to the nearest one number, 28 degrees there. What's the significance of the numbers that we just found? Well, actually, there is a general guideline for how these trails are rated, and you can see it over here. So roughly, a green run has a what we call a grade or gradient of 25%. Blue runs are a step up. They can go up to about 40%. Anything bigger than that, then that's when you have your black runs. Now, comparing them to our runs, we have our gradient, but that's as a fraction. So I'm just going to write that as a decimal. 1 over 3, that's just 0.3 reoccurring and 9 over 14 well it's roughly 0 0.64 with a lot of decimals after that so if i was to write these as percentages that's roughly 30 percent and that's roughly 64 percent so can you see now that this is actually falling within the range because blue runs can go up to roughly again 40 percent and anything more than 40 percent is going to be a black run and same thing with the angles right blue runs go to about 22 degrees which our one does meet it up and then our black run is more than 22 degrees. It's 28 degrees, actually. Other things to note that I thought they were interesting, uh, trails are rated actually by their most difficult areas. So even if there are some green and blue parts along there and some parts are black, then they have to be rated black. And some other things are that if there's some um, difficult terrain or some exposed trees and rocks and things like that, that can also uh, change the rating of these particular trails. And last but certainly not least, Will the snow that you see here still be there tomorrow? It's something really important to skiers and snowboarders that when there is a big dump of snow, that it actually stays there throughout the week. And so many things can take it away, whether it's hot weather, whether it's the rain, whether it's just skied out, and the levels can change dramatically, even overnight. Take this run here. This is Accelerator, and I've just taken some snapshots from the snow cams over the season. You can see it starts off quite nice, and over time, oh. Oh no, that's uh, not, not quite good now. And, oh, okay, well that's definitely not skiable. <laughs> and whenever you look at the mathematics of real life situations, it's always going to be complex because there's just so many things to consider. What part of the mountain are we looking at? Is the snow packed in very much? Is there going to be rain? Is there going to be sun? Do many people ski through that area? And so how we can start looking at these kinds of problems is with something called a differential equation. Now, a differential equation is essentially a fancy word for saying uh, an equation that represents how things change. And so when we start looking at these equations, we can start considering these variables and get an idea of the relationships that exist between the parts 
that actually change the rate of how fast snow will melt. We may not always get it exactly right, but we can get an idea of what's going to happen. Now in Australia, this is actually a really big problem because Australia doesn't typically get as much snowfall as other uh, ski resorts like in Europe and America and some parts of Asia. So we actually have these really big snow guns that you might see all along these runs and they actually uh, produce snow when the conditions are right, when it's cold enough, and they can actually make artificial snow that can still make the runs good even when there is no snowfall. So I hope that gets you thinking that next time you're carving up on the slopes, that mathematics is actually everywhere around us. It's all there, tucked away. For more cool content, check out the hashtag MathTrainsBrains. There's a lot of great stuff going out there at the moment. In the meantime, leave a like for the maths, sub for the doozy. I'll catch you in the next one. Let's go, baby. Gumption. Oh, oh dude. Oh, you see, right? oh, that's fine.